Hey guys, welcome to Urology Biology. Today on the bench, I have got a Grand Seiko again. You voted, you got it. It is the reference 4420-9000. I'm gonna strip it down, clean everything, and rebuild it. Okay guys, let's get down with the Grand Seiko 4420-9000, the strip down. This watch has been an interesting one to work on, I'm not gonna lie. There were things that I really liked about it, and there was things that I did not like about it. And the clue is on the screen right now. Check out the jewels. Man, it was not normal and not super fresh. Virtually every single jewel had a, a kiff lock on it or their Dioshock system. I'm not lying, guys. It took me so long to oil this damn thing. It took virtually as long to oil it as it did to rebuild the damn watch. Not cool, not fresh, and super, super annoying. I hate those little things. And they went overboard on this. Now, don't get me wrong, there were some super nice things that I did like about this, which I will discuss later on in this video. So, basically, I have obviously taken the case back off and I've removed that crown gasket, which basically just fell off. And you can see the movement inside and it's really, really nice. It is a hand winder, it is a Grand Seiko, so quality is there. And there was one thing inside this watch which really took me back and I was really surprised to see it. And... Yeah, I'm not going to lie, I thought it was actually quite an ingenious thing and something I've actually not seen on other watches, so real pleasant surprise to see coming up. So I'm removing the case back uh, movement holders. That was held in with two screws and there's an additional one which basically just keeps it pressed against the case back as well. And then we can see the dial. The dial is actually really nice apart from one imperfection and yeah it's a little bit annoying and personally I think it's obviously something that's just happened with being careless and it is that little line mark area around the 12 o'clock and the only thing that we can think of in regards to this is that the hour hand at some point in its life must have been rubbing against the dial basically to cause that because yeah I cannot think what else would have basically caused it. It definitely wasn't in this time because I did check the hour hand and it certainly wasn't touching the dial but of course it doesn't mean that in the past uh, that it wasn't. Uh, maybe somebody else serviced it many years ago and rectified that problem but of course the damage had already been done. It's still a beautiful dial and other than that little mark on it it really is nice condition. So it's got two uh, dial feed screws on the side of the movement. One, I must admit, I didn't like the location of it because it is directly above the balance. And I think that's a bit of a bad place to have that seeing as it's such a delicate part. And obviously you gotta look out for that. And you don't wanna prang it. No sir, not cool. So once the dial's off, just pop that aside and get it out of the way. And then I can continue to break this watch down. So I'm taking off the uh, dial washer and the hour wheel and it's a simple hand wind movement it's not super complicated it is a Grand Seiko so it is quality and you really can see the quality on this movement it's built really well like I said there's things that I didn't like about it and there's things that I really did like about it but overall from a build quality yeah it's super fresh if you are enjoying this super fresh super nice video I know I am then please hit a like on this and feel free to drop a comment below. You can also subscribe to the Horology Biology channel. Make sure to check the bell icon if you do. This way you'll be notified when all the next super fresh, super nice HB goodness will be available. So the watch has been turned over and now I can remove the balance to keep that safe. It's actually a balance bridge rather than a balance cock because this one, as you can see, similar to some Rolex models, it's got two screws holding it in. I much prefer the ones with uh, just one screw if I'm honest, uh, but like you can see on the screen, this one comes with two. So you have to be extra careful with this, obviously you don't want to prang it and then you're going to end up having to deal with some spring work, which is not cool. So put that aside, keep it safe and you're going to obviously put that back onto the movement later on. So now, as there is no wind left in the watch, because I removed any wind that was in it, I can remove the pallet bridge as well. That's also held in with two screws on this one. Sometimes they're just with the one, uh, but this is with two. 
So just easing it off with the screwdriver. Just be careful when you do this because there's a delicate pivot underneath on the pallet forks and you don't want to break those. So you need to be really careful. And then basically I will just pop those aside and I will clean those by hand. So next off comes the ratchet wheel and you can see that it's really polished up really nice on this watch. Uh, there's a combination of brushed metal and polished parts as well. And it's just a really nice finish. And again, these are the really nice touches that I like on vintage watches. Most people will never ever in their whole life see what is inside their watch, which in a way is a shame, especially if it's not an exhibition case back, which this obviously isn't. So only people like myself or people who really, really open the watch, which obviously is not many, get to see all this juicy goodness inside. So removing the click and the click spring, this has a really tiny little click spring, uh, very similar to the ones that are on Omegas. And I just want to keep that safe because obviously it is really tiny. And I'm getting close to seeing what I was going to be talking to you guys about. So reverse threaded screw for the crown wheel, very small screw, but obviously unscrews the opposite way. And then I can take that off as well. This watch does actually have a hacking system as well, similar to the other Grand Seiko that I worked on, which is really nice. So obviously when you pull the crown out to set the time, it will stop the second sand immediately. So now I'm just easing off the train of wheels bridge. That's held in with two screws. And as you can see, those annoying jewels, man, each one capped, not normal, not normal. Train of wheels underneath. These all get inspected under the microscope, making sure that the pivots are in good condition. And before I get further on this, because the hack is actually in the way, so I cannot release the other wheel. I need to remove the barrel bridge. Quick inspect to make sure everything's fine. And this is the thing that I really liked about this, the barrel. The barrel is jeweled on the top and on the bottom. That's something that I've not seen before, but it's absolutely brilliant because it definitely reduces wear but to actually have it jeweled on the top and the bottom, I mean, the expense alone in regards to production must have just been like so much more because so many watches just don't have this. But of course it reduces wear because obviously it's not metal on metal that's rubbing. And Seiko did certainly did not cut any corners when it came to this. It's not a high beat watch either. It runs at 18,000 beats per hour. But yeah, these guys did not scrimp. Uh, I was thoroughly, thoroughly surprised when I saw this barrel bridge, sorry, this uh, mainspring barrel. The fact that it was jeweled on the top of it and on the bottom. And then there's an additional jewel, as you can see, on the movement itself as well. So yeah, I'm not exactly sure what the actual jewel count is on this watch, but it's a lot. So off comes this other little cock, which is holding this uh, center wheel just on. And the movement obviously is getting pretty much close to being stripped down. So I flipped it over onto the dial side, just removing this little plate, which is covering over the minute wheel and the intermediate wheel. A little bit sticky. It's probably been a while since it was serviced. And even on the minute wheel as well, on the minute wheel where it sits, that is jeweled as well. Seriously, I am thoroughly impressed with these uh, Grand Seikos. I mean, it's the second one that I've worked on now and quality, man. I mean, these guys, these guys, these Japanese guys know what they're doing. They're putting the Swiss to shame, man. Seriously, I didn't think I would say it, but, but I said it. And as you can see on the dial side as well, there is more of those cap stones as well, which was super annoying. <laughs> Speaking of annoying, 
Remember a few weeks ago when I was talking about my neighbors and they were doing the renovations and everything? Well, that is not finished. No, sir. It's still carrying on. Even today it has been going on as well. I mean, it's now in the evening, so I'm doing the voiceover for this video, which is, yeah, it's not a problem. It's all quiet now. But there's nothing more annoying than just listening to drilling just going on and on and on. So it got that bad in the end. I was like, you know what? Forget this. I'm going to go to the gym. going to get my workout on. going to get my gains on. Okay, really doesn't work like that. I mean, I'm not kind of like just a guy that hangs out at the juice bar. I do actually do stuff, so don't think that I don't. But um, yeah, I must admit, it was better to go there than just to sit here and listen to the racket that these guys are producing. But I just hope it ends soon because it's not fresh. No, sir, it's really not. Okay, so this movement is really getting stripped down now. It's pretty much all done. Just pegging out these jewels. And then I can put the uh, balance back on before it goes into the cleaning machine. Must admit, I do find the, the balance cocks easier to put on than these uh, balance bridges. Definitely just see, maybe it's just a psychological thing, but it just seems easier to me. So I got another camera and that's why you see in these other close-up shots from a different angle. I thought I would uh, get one uh, because it was a decent deal and it had a good lens on it as well. But I need to move the location of it because I noticed that it's a little bit too shaky because I actually had it connected to the bench as well. So anytime I obviously made a little bit of a movement, it of course would move as well. So I think next time I will just use uh, one of my tripods and then I'll have it next to the bench rather than actually touching it so yeah my apologies for that guys so popped open the mainspring barrel uh, taking out the arbor and taking out the mainspring and it's really greasy in there as you can see like super super grimy And you have to be careful when grease gets really thick because it attracts dirt and it can actually turn into more of like a paste. And paste and dirt become like friction and that can actually cause scarring and damage to the metal, which is not good. And especially when we're dealing with really small parts. I mean, look, if you can see it, there is a lot of gunk on that that I'm cleaning off. So on the case, just removing the old gasket. Luckily, it was an easy one to come off. No problems with it at all. Usually I find they're either rock hard or they turn into this gooey mush. And the other thing that I want to do is obviously pop the crystal for this. And it's got a crystal ring around this like a little bezel so I need to pop that off with a case knife again it came off really easy I uh, didn't have to apply a massive amount of attention to that crystal has a lot of scratches on it as you're gonna see and I wanted to keep it original as possible so I decided to restore the crystal as well with my sanding techniques uh, because it's better than replacing it it really is if, if it's not cracked you can pretty much get away with it with a plexi so just removing any light dirt that's on the dial. Like I said, this dial is in really good condition other than that mark around the 12, which is annoying. And then what I'm doing now is I'm using a version on, uh, it's like a leather buffer chamois, like a little pen. And you can really buff up these uh, hour markers and hands. Really does a nice job actually. It makes them all shiny and new. So all the parts, everything to do with the watch now will basically go into the cleaning machine. So I'm basically putting everything on all these little baskets that you can see. I speed it up because it can take a bit of time. The case minus the case back will all get a nice ultrasonic clean and the parts will all go in my Elmer super automatic, super fresh automatic. That's what it should say. So I thought you guys would like to see this a little bit more than I usually show of this. So I filmed it a little bit more this time so you can see how it works. 
And like I said, it is an automatic. So you simply set the timer, you press the button and zzz, 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 off it goes. So a little bit of water on top of this crystal and I'm basically sanding this down. So if you guys want to know about this, there is a video that I did where I show how I do this. It's basically using different grades of sandpaper and you want to build it up to a finer consistency. And then I finish it off with some polywatch cream, buff it up and well, as you can see guys, it looks pretty nice. So I can basically just pop this straight back onto the watch now and put that uh, bezel ring around it again. And you can just fit that on with a crystal press. This crystal basically just fits on very easily and it is the bezel which holds it all in place. I really liked it as well, it was minimum effort. No uh, big having to mess around with this, no sir. And there we have that guys, I think that looks pretty good. Crystal looking really fresh. It's amazing how much a, a difference an unscratched crystal can make, seriously. <laughs> So everything's clean, everything is good to go, so now we can concentrate on the rebuild. So I have got the mainspring barrel here, got a new mainspring for it as well. Just added some 1300 to it at the bottom, and then I can pop in this new mainspring. Usually they're color-coded, but this one didn't, it had like a serrated kind of edge to it, so that obviously was the right way to put it in. I did double check but I'm assuming that's why it's serrated on one side and smooth on the other. So you can simply just press these in and then just lightly press on your tweezers just if something else, if it needs a little bit more extra assurance because I have had it in the past where I thought it was in and it wasn't and then if you release the cap and it's not fully in, it will pang out and yeah, you need to be careful with that. You could take an eye out, seriously. It is held under a massive amount of tension. So in goes the arbor, little oil, some 1300, and then I can add the uh, barrel cap back on, and then that's just press fit, friction fit. Really impressed, seriously, I am really, really impressed with these double jeweled Barrels. So nice, man. If only every watch was like that, but it has to be a cost thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, look at it. Look at the quality of this. Beautiful. So this is where the fun began for me. So I have to remove their Dioshock system. It's not particularly hard. I just much prefer the Inca block system because the spring stays connected to the movement. Whereas with the Dioshock, it completely comes away. So you have more chance of losing it basically. And it can be a little bit more fiddly trying to get it back in. So removing the capstone uh, with a piece of Rodico and then I use my finger on a piece of clean paper and I just clean off any dried oil and then I want to give it some fixer drop treatment as well to clean it and also basically it helps when I add the oil to this when I oil this I will use some 9010 and it basically means that the oil will all be kept in one place and it won't run away on itself it makes your job a hell of a lot easier And guys, you will be happy to know that I spared you and I did not film every single jewel. But I would like to give a shout out as well to all of my members. Uh, there's a handful of you and I'm quite surprised that it's even that. I am super appreciated that you guys have joined. Uh, if anybody else wants to join the Urology Biology channel, you can hit the join button below. Little video will pop up, it will tell you what you get. You basically get super fresh, super nice emojis from me. You also get the priority replies as well. And most importantly, you are really helping support this channel. 
These videos take a lot of work, not gonna lie. I mean, the editing, it can take a day and I enjoy it very much. I really find it uh, therapeutic actually. I find it a good buzz. And I think it's really great as well when I get feedback from you guys that you've enjoyed the videos and that you're actually learning something from it and you actually find it beneficial. So that's really cool for me. Uh, and I'm just really, really happy with the support that you guys have shown. I mean, it's just been over six months now since I launched the Horology Biology YouTube channel and I'm really happy how it's growing. So if you're liking this and you're not already subscribed, please subscribe, please like the video. And if you've got anything that you want to comment, please drop a comment as well. It really helps that YouTube algorithm, apparently, I've heard. So it would help my views get more. I would like more views. That means more people get to see this juicy content. And the community will only get bigger and bigger. And I think that's a positive thing. So just put it in the center wheel and then I put on this little cock plate, uh, which just secures that. Held in with just the one screw. And then I can put in the barrel. I mean, even the quality of it, it just looks super nice. That super nice goldy color. Mmm. Nice. So in goes the escape wheel. So recently as well, I had two super jets sent to me. I didn't film it, if I'm honest, purely because I think there's been quite a lot of Enneka already on this channel. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Enneka and I know you guys too, too. But the movements inside, it's the same as movements that I've already serviced on the channel. So I don't think it would have been anything new. But um, the guy that sent me them, he said that they belonged to his father and um, they weren't in the best condition, but I've we basically talked about it and I've made one look really, really nice and then the other one looks okay. So it was like basically, because they were both the same, it was like trying to get the best of both worlds, uh, or should I say, trying to get the best parts from both of them into one. So like making one really good watch and one okay watch, let's say. But uh, I'm happy how that turned out, so I've been quite busy with that. I put new hands on one as well, so I'll have to drop a picture for you guys as well in the community post. Um, because yeah, uh, especially the, the, the main one, let's say, the, 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 the main one, the good one, or the better one. Um, oh man, it looks really nice with those hands, uh, and also a, an original crystal as well, a, a brand new one. And it's amazing what a difference it can make just with a brand new set of hands, brand new crystal, brings a watch back to life. From how it looked originally, yes, looks really good. If you have if you basically follow me on Instagram, I've got the images on there actually. The befores and afters, so you can see it on there. So I've added the barrel bridge and of course I've added the click and the click spring, which is what I'm doing now. And you can see that I've just added as well the crown wheel. And just to remind you guys, I'm pretty sure you won't even forget anyway. Reverse threaded screw guys means that you screw it the opposite way than you usually would. If you screw it the normal way, like any other screw, you'll break it basically. The reason being behind this is obviously is that when you're winding the watch, if it was the normal fashion, the screw would basically unwind itself. So this is why they use a reverse threaded screw. You don't have it on every movement. A lot of other movements, they will use two screws. If there's two screws, it's not a problem. And some Omega calibers as well, they use one screw, but it's off center. So it's like on the right side of it or on the left side of it, so to speak. So again, it's, it's, it's not an issue. It only seems to be an issue if the screw is bang in the middle. So flip the movement over and I'm adding a little bit of grease to 
uh, the post where the cannon pinion is going to go. Looks like I'm adding a lot, but I'm not. It's just a lot on the oiler and I just lightly touch it just to get a little bit off. And then I can snap the cannon pinion back on. That is also friction fit. Just giving a little test on the barrel wall there to see that it moves and it's engaging correctly, which it was. And this was also an interesting factor about this watch. So the setting lever screw is not a screw, it's actually a post. So it's one of those ones where you push it down. But it was actually two piece. I've only, never seen them two piece before. I've only ever seen them as one complete piece when it's like that. So that was another interesting factor about it, that it was a two piece non-screw version. So a little bit more grease to the sliding pinion where the clutch is going to go. Sorry, where the yoke is going to go, I should say. And I'm just checking that everything's engaged here as well. So I've added a little bit of oil onto the top of that setting lever screw, we'll call it, even though technically it's not a screw. Very strange that it's in two pieces. I've uh, not seen it like that before. So yeah, it's also getting much colder now as well. I don't know how you guys have been surviving, but... Uh... Okay, so... I had to set up a new contract with the electric company. So previously, when I was living with my ex-partner, we were paying around 150, 160 bucks a month. The contract was in her name even though it came out of my bank account. So that had to get cancelled and I had to basically organize a new one myself, which is fair enough. So when I rang them up and I said, yeah, basically I need to sort it out. You know, you've got my details. Said, yeah, it's no problem. And I, and I knew that we, we paid for two of us like about 160 bucks. Now I'm living here on my own and these guys were trying to charge me 485 euros a month for electric. And I don't even have gas. No, sir. Everything is all electric. Now, I understand there's a lot of bad things going on in the world right about now in regards to energy prices. But I was like, listen, that's unrealistic. I said, I can't afford that. I managed to negotiate a little bit cheaper, but psychologically, I don't know how you guys have been surviving with the, about this, but yeah, it's been like freaking me out a little bit if I want to put a radiator on or something. So I think I have about seven or eight radiators where I am and I'm using like three maximum seriously like I just use if I'm in a room I'm using that radiator and that's it you know I mean yeah we have to make cutbacks I suppose but uh, I was just absolutely shocked at how expensive they were trying to increase it considering that 50% of the usage would obviously be dropped seeing as I'm the only person here Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So that's the keyless works all sorted out. And uh, I'm just adding the final touches. So basically just added the uh, setting lever spring. Also added in that little uh, clamp that covers over the minute wheel and the intermediate wheel. And now I can flip the movement back over, which I have. And I'm going to basically install the pallet forks. So I clean them by hand because you don't want to put them through the cleaning machine and then I give them some fixer drop treatment. And it's also important as well, I've mentioned before, that you basically clean the fixer drop off of the pivots because you want to reduce friction. And this is how I do it. Just use a little bit of wood and it just basically cleans those pivots because you just want to remove anything off of those. Quick blow again to make sure that there's no debris on there and then I can install those into the movement. Any kind of friction that you add unnecessarily is going to basically affect the amplitude of the watch. So, I mean, the thing is as well is I've thought about this before and I touched on this in one of my other videos. It's really good to have a timographer because it also helps you in regards to showing you a reading of what it is. But it can actually become a little bit of psychological warfare and I'm pretty sure other guys out there must who use them must experience the same 
because you can have watches that will run fine and you've had them for years and they run and there's no problem. And then you check them on a timographer and you just think, man, it looks so bad. And it can become a little bit of a psychological warfare. And I know an old watchmaker I used to use years ago, he also said to me, don't turn it into a psychological war with yourself with a timographer. It's a referencing guide and it's really good to use. And it is really good to get the best results you can. But yeah, it, it, if, if you guys are understanding what I'm trying to say, it can become like a little bit of a psychological warfare. Like you're trying to get the best of the best and sometimes it's not possible. So pallets are installed. I also oiled them off camera as well and I've put the balance on and the watch is obviously running which is really nice. I mean it was before so I didn't expect why it wouldn't run this time unless I'd done something tragically wrong. So a little 1300 onto the side of the cannon pinion where the hour wheel is going to go. And then I can pop that on and then I can also add the dial washer as well before I put the dial on. So I'm just basically giving it a little wind now, just, just to make sure that it's engaged correctly. That little ring that you can see on the side next to the crown, that's actually from inside the crown. Uh, I believe because the gasket was out, it's obviously come a little bit loose. So when I put a new gasket in later on, it'll basically keep that in place. So I can pop the dial back on. Oh, and I've really polished up those uh, hour markers. They look really nice and shiny. I'm really happy with how they've come out. Just nipping up the dial feed screws on the side. And now I can basically put the hands on the watch. As there's no date on this watch, uh, yeah, I mean, you can pretty much put the, the hand where you want. The hour hand, should I say. So quick check to make sure that it's not touching anything. And then I will set it to 12 o'clock uh, before I put on the minute hand. Yeah, I'm still baffled by those marks because it is in perfect alignment for it to be that our hand that could have caused that damage. But at the same time, it doesn't sit really low unless somebody really pushed it so hard to force it so low. But then I would have thought that it would have got trapped by the Seiko logo because it, that is actually raised. So maybe it wasn't the hand that caused the damage to the dial. Maybe it was somebody who dropped it or scratched it by accident. I don't know. Beautiful hands as well on this watch, as you can see, guys. So just added the second hand on. And then just a light press down. Another tip as well when you've added the second hand, uh, if you want to make sure if you put it on enough, use your blower. And I blow on it like really hard just to see if it moves on its own. So push the crown in because it's got a hack feature so it will stop the second hand. Basically it stops the movement. So now it is new crown gasket time. So you can get these uh, generical ones, all different sizes. You just basically find one that fits. I went for the biggest, pretty much the biggest one. Give it a little bit of silicone grease. And then I can just squeeze that on. Just use your tweezers, it's pretty straightforward. So I'm adding a little bit of grease as well to the winding stem. I always do that at the end as well. Uh, some people do it while they're actually building up the watch for the first time, but I, I genuinely leave it until right at the end. So cased up the watch and the movements inside. Then I can put in the movement holder. 
and push the crown in with the winding stem. And that also indicates me that I've got it in the right place, which obviously helps. It's funny with the Enica ones, you can just push it and it'll just override it and click all the way in. But I found that with the uh, Seiko one, you have to, similar to the Omega ones, you have to push it down and then push it in. So I'm just checking that that's engaged, which it is. And the movement does look really nice, actually. Super clean, super shiny. Just aligning the um, movement holder. And then that's just held in with the two screws. Quite large screws, but they're deliberately large so that the head will basically clamp it down. So new gasket as well, obviously, for the back of the case. Again, with some silicone grease. It keeps it more supple and it also makes it more manageable when you're fitting it in. Because it's greasy and slippy. And it just, uh, yeah, goes in pretty straightforward. Most of the watches, they will have a groove for it. Some of them go on the back of the case backs rather than the actual movement itself. But this one, similar to the Enikers as well, it will go actually on the case. And then I can put on the case back and we're really close to the end with this. Just want to check it obviously on the timographer as well to see how it's going. Bear in mind, I have not regulated this, but the amplitude yeah, it was around 170 or something like that, which was very low. So I was suspecting that it was going to be one of those do not open uh, barrels, uh, which it was not. So obviously I opened it. And considering that it's not been regulated yet, I'm pretty happy with the results. Decent amplitude up in the 270s. A hell of a lot better than what it was, and it's already looking pretty good. I'll regulate it in a few days as well. So there we have it, guys. Grand Seiko reference number 4420-9000. If you like this video, hit a like on it, leave a comment in the comment section, and of course, if you are enjoying the Urology Biology channel, please subscribe. Guys, as always, until next time.